Good morning and welcome back to the next session. So as I mentioned, uh, by the way, you would have noticed that in this workshop, we are spending as much time as we spend on the teaching learning mechanisms of programming as we wish to spend on use of different technologies. Okay, so the Akash demonstration, the clicker demonstration was part of it. The use of Moodle, with which you are already familiar, is part of it. The EDX presentation was part of it. And in future, when you create your own lessons for presentations, you should be able to use the best of the technologies. So there are two specific points. One is designing visual communication for education. That is one part, where there are some uh, uh, unbelievably simple sort of standards which have been worked out by people who are experts, but we as teachers are not familiar. Whether it is a question of color scheme, whether it is a question of emphasis, etc. Et the second is educational animation was a topic which has never been discussed by the teaching learning community ever. Notice that we all teach and learn mostly from the printed books yet, and the books in the printed form can never exploit animation. They can at most exploit pictures or graphs and such thing. Since using computers, it is possible for our students to actually use animations for effective learning. It is important for us as a teachers to understand how such educational animations are created and what kind of impact they can have. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I requested my colleague uh, Samir Sastrabuddhe. I already told you about him, that he has just finished his PhD. Uh, more importantly, he was associated with the first full-length animation film that was prepared by the Z Group, right, in Bangalore. Both he and his wife. Suddenly, one day they decided to quit industry and come to academics. So that is when he came to us. And he has been with us since the early days of our distance education program. He helped us design all the studios. He helped us design all the uh, interactive things at the initial stages. Now, of course, as I mentioned, Mr. Sajjan Dekshit and Sushant take care of all that. But he now concentrates on educational animation. So without further ado, I'll request him to uh, conduct this session telling you about the things that he has discovered, telling about things which other colleagues have discovered, and jointly with the other teaching coming. And the objective here is that whenever you go back and you teach, you will not only teach for such workshops and so on, you will be teaching your regular courses. But each one of you should be able to maximally use this technology as effectively as possible. I will be requesting him to conduct such a session in the regular T10KT workshop also for 10,000 teachers. So all yours. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I requested Professor Fatak for this small intro, uh, basically because I thought it will be a kind of visual jerk also for you to see this slide in the uh, kind of presentations and uh, series of talks which are going on. Uh, so. Let us just begin. The outline of the talk today is uh, mainly about what happened? Not visible. Uh, is the brightness a problem? What are the problems? Fonts can't be seen, okay. Colors is really bad. Okay. You can't see the graphics properly. But what is the most scary part of this thing? Can you see that at the bottom? Two of 137. So 137 slides like this is, is the biggest problem, right? I was just joking, actually. Uh, <laughs> this is just to show you that <laughs> how uh, visual communication will actually have um, impact on whatever you are saying, even if you are saying very profound things. But uh, minus that becomes a problem, right? So communication 
with appropriate visuals makes uh, a drastic difference. And the topic today I'm going to talk is about use of text and graphics. And by graphics, I mean uh, static graphics or motion graphics as they call it. And we'll come to that actually. Uh, I would like to actually uh, give full credit to uh, Dr. Kentaro Toyama now. Now he's a doctor. Uh, he uh, used to lead the Microsoft Research India uh, when I attended his talk uh, at Bangalore, exactly on the same point. And uh, so most of the slides are taken from his talk and that is why I would like to credit him. And it, it's available online. You can search for Kentaro Toyama and uh, search for this presentation. Uh, better still, you will also get slides of what I am going to speak. So you can, you can get both the copies, okay. Um, I believe actually Professor Fatak uh, had mentioned long time uh, that he has one particular session on what's in the name and that actually targets to uh, a standard practice to be followed for even naming your files and documents the way you have to. I don't know whether it is part of this program right now, the week long, but it will be certainly part of the bigger uh, course when he is going to teach it. But I thought that on the same lines, it also makes important uh, thing to, to address these kind of questions. What's in the font? What's in the color? What's in the design? And uh, that is because I've come across some very, very, uh, I should not say bad, but very, very poorly designed slides sometimes. And that makes me think that is it the lack of uh, known guidelines, which is the problem. So I just thought I'll compile a couple of guidelines from every domain and try to package them into this talk today. So we'll just do that. The slide here actually shows, uh, 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 I don't know how many people had read about this news in between. A school boy uh, of Indian origin in US uh, made a claim that you can save $400 million if you change the official font of United States of America from Times New Roman to something called Garamond. The idea was that since Garamond is a lighter and a thinner font, the amount of ink used to be printed on paper will be so much less that suddenly for a year they will save $400 million. Let's not go into the details of that because a lot of designers bashed him later on about <laughs> the kind of claims he was making. Obviously, it is like you have thinner font, it will consume less ink, but the fact of the matter is that it should be legitimate. You should be able to see it. And as you can see on the visual, it's, it's not that clear as compared to Times New Roman. So it's like saying that my, uh, my elevator will carry 20 people if everybody is of 20 kgs each. So that's fine, but if you just reduce that um, standards, uh, automatically you will, com you will compress more, more stuff into that. So this was uh, something about, uh, I just read in between, but the point is if you say that legitimacy, like readability is my objective, then definitely you have some choices. So you can't just uh, compromise on other things yeah, at the cost of readability. Similarly, what's in the design? I agree you have, you have complicated diagrams to explain, you have, you have complex visuals and you have to uh, talk about relational data, uh, you have to show relationship between some data points. Obviously, it is a complicated manner, but is this uh, addressing your objective? You can hardly see it, right? So what's in the design? What's in the color? This is, uh, it's not joking. This is exactly from a slide uh, available on SlideShare and not as an example of bad design. It is, it is published there. I'm not giving the credit deliberately because I don't want to defame the person, but that's how it is. So what's in the color? People choose very arbit colors at times. Um, for some objective probably they have in mind, but is there a theory which tells you that what should be the best color for a given thing? So such and more things we'll be uh, exploring during these things. So just to start off, let's see some of the examples. For uh, just, this is a page from a C++ tutorial available online and it's some section 0 0.3 about how to use this tutorial. Can, can you just spot some problems in this? Okay. Too much text, okay. Can anybody see the, uh, the code here? There is some code written here. You can't, right? It's so mixed up with the text, you can't really see that. Okay, a modified version of the same thing. Now what's the, what's the feedback? Can you see this? Better? Uh, okay, uh, can you see the code now? Because it is in a box, it is indented, 
right? Uh, what is more interesting in this, like additional feature, what you can see here? Colors. Colors, okay, colors. Apart from that? Navigation, yes. So you get navigation here and you know at least what's the next lesson and what was the previous lesson. It makes more simpler for you to navigate through it. Okay, one more modification. What about this? Can you see the code now? But there is a code, right? You can see because it is indented completely to the center now. You can't miss it. Plus, what happens? Additional features. You have the left hand menu where not only the next lesson and the previous lesson, you can see all the lessons, right? Plus, what you can see more? You can see here that there is an option called start exercise. That button says start exercise. If you click on that button, a new window opens here where you can check your C++ skills by typing and see, compiling it to see the output, right? This is, so the migration what I am trying to tell you is perfect use of technology in terms of, not only in terms of the content, but also in terms of how you present it. So for something like C++ where you have to really do it to see the output, you can't say that, okay, read this HTML page, go to your other window, type something, do it. If you don't find it, come back, relocate where you had left, uh, you had, uh, left it out and then again start from that place. So it's, it's pretty uh, taxing for the person who is using it and that alt tab is creating lot more problems than uh, he or she could have imagined. So such things actually are adding value to this. So what has been added in this due course of time is little bit of visual communication principles, little bit of interaction design principles, how people interact with computers and then the output is uh, looking better. Okay, so this is actually a part of uh, a course what I, uh, I teach normally to uh, students. So I'm just graying out the first part because you being teachers, I don't have to tell you how to plan topics. You are all experts on that. What I'm going to just anyway emphasize on is how well can you execute what you have planned and how well can you use the tools to impress. Now impress is uh, very important here because whatever you want to say, whatever you want to tell people, you expect them to carry it back with them. So it's not something you just read there, listen to the person and then go off and forget. You want them to have that, uh, not only up to the recall level, like uh, tomorrow I think Professor Sridhar Iyer and Professor Sahana Murthy are going to talk about it, but yeah, you will require higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy for uh, getting the maximum output. So you just don't want them to recall. You want them to apply that knowledge. So you have to go to the higher levels. For all that, the, the way you are going to express your thoughts is through your presentations and the talking. So let us just go into that point. So this is a typical uh, layout of a slide. Uh, I'm going to, I'm just taking random examples now. Uh, this is, this has a, uh, a standard set of features. You have a topic, you have subtopics, you have bullets, you have some images. Interesting point here is that what should be the weightage difference between each of these topics? So what should start as the heading and what should be the, the subheading and so and so forth has to have a, a definite balance between each other and we will come to that. So when we say that uh, graphics are useful, uh, the first question comes to mind is that what are the basic types of graphics and uh, people have been using graphics uh, most of the time without even uh, realizing what type of graphic they are using. So I will show you some examples and probably you can correct me if I am wrong. So there are some static graphics and some visual motion graphics which we can translate as uh, videos and animations further but we will not go into that. So the first and the basic type of visual is called the decorative graphics. So this is a, the classic example of decorative graphics are newspapers. So you know today is the voting day and you will find this finger with a, a line or you will find a ballot box or something irrespective of whether it, they, are, they are talking about Maharashtra or they are talking about Madhya Pradesh, they will have the same old picture all the time. It's just to grab the attention and break the monotony of the all text which is there in the newspaper. That's just the, the, the task of that particular graphic is only that much. But when we go one step ahead, the thing which is called uh, as representational graphics will give you much more than that because they are photographs which will tell you the exact representation of what is happening. So if you want to say that in Surat today there were huge rows of uh, people standing for voting, you have to show a picture of Surat and you have to show people. 
right? You can't say uh, just by illustration that there were like huge crowds because then that is not representation. You have to actually defend it. And one of the good example of this representational graphic in modern day times is a screenshot because when you tell somebody that okay when you right click you will get three options and you have to select the middle one it's very difficult to imagine that setting without that software so the screenshot will exactly tell you how it looks there is another interesting type of graphic called mnemonic graphic and uh, how many people know this um, when somebody will ask you how many days in october a lot of people start doing this this is just embedded in your mind so much that you don't forget it and you just try doing it this is associative um, uh, graphic memory which we will carry so these are some of the uh, graphics which are used for um, uh, memory recall purpose to show some qualitative relationship so i have to say that what is the distance between the main gate and the vmcc a, a map is useful because it is written there already that it is not to scale and you can just know that okay relatively VMCC is far away as compared to Crescent. So that much you can just make out, but not in absolute terms. If you, and you want to show quantitative relationship, what can be used? If you want to show quantitative relationship between two, yes, you can show graphs. You can show pie charts, you can show graphs where you can exactly, and I don't have to elaborate on that. There is like huge range available. We'll come to that, uh, what type of graph is good for what type of data, but right now I will just start at this point where we say for quantity we use graphs and pie charts. The next one is interesting for people who want to talk about different processes and procedures happening during their thoughts, whatever uh, explanation they are providing. So if you have to say that at this point the pulley is getting down and the weight is getting up, it is proven that at certain in certain cases even the video is not as effective as this graphic. Can you tell me why? So I show a video of this same thing and I show a graphic like this called transformational graphic of the same thing and it is found out that the video was not effective as compared to this. Can anybody um, just take a try on why it should be like that? Yeah. Because in this diagram we see all states together. Yes. Initial, middle and last state. Yes. But in video we can see only the current state. We can't see all states together. Okay, okay. agreed. Anybody has to, has to add to what he said? It is also uh, showing you the um, exact point what the teacher wanted to emphasize. So in video the person has a chance to pause whatever they want to. But that point of pausing may be wrong. So you can't have that control over the students. So here you can exactly show what is the point at which the weight gets lifted. So you know that point. So you can only copy that point and say that, that this is the step one, step two and step three. In video it's just going and you just don't have control where to pause and play. So such kind of things happen. But from here, the things are happening. So if you read the line below the name of the graphic, here we are talking about change over time. So till then, uh, till this point, what I was showing you was having no change over time. So then there are graphs, you had change over time, but not continuous. You had 1999 data and 2000 data, but here you have change over time. So as weight increases or as the weight is pulled down, the thing goes up is a change over time. But similarly, in the next one, where it is interpretive graphic, you have some other forces also acting on. So you have arrows and you have, you can use more colors and say that when the air enters from this side and moves around this turbine and the hot air goes on the other side. So the entire story is being told in a single graphic now. So this is called interpretive graphic, which is used to illustrate a theory or a principle. Now, uh, this is taken up from uh, popular research by Clark and Lyons uh, called uh, a book called Graphics for Learning. It's a very interesting book. Um, you guys can go back and ask your libraries to procure that. Probably it will be useful in future for you. But they have classified what are the types of content, first of all, and what are the matching types of uh, visuals which can be used for that particular type of content. Now, uh, for something like facts and uh, concepts, what type of visual should be used. So that is what they try to show in this particular book. And the entire book has various examples of how they have confirmed these theories that for this type of content, what type of visual is useful. Uh, another disclaimer, the slides which will have these green dots will be the guideline slides. So in total presentation, when you finish, you can just take this PDF and you can just take separately those green dot side slides as guideline slides, like what uh, Professor Fatak was mentioning. So just coming to uh, this comparison of qualitative and quantitative. 
So we have data in terms of a table where we want to show something from 2006 and 2007 and the best representation was graphs. We already saw that. But within tables also, there are, this is actually a screenshot from a table which is, which is uh, presented in a paper. Now the problem is uh, that we can't read it correctly. Any, any ideas why we can't read it correctly? Because it should have been something like this. Is this better? Because the decimals are aligned first of all. We don't want repetition of, when we, when we say that county is uh, in the column first, so we don't want to say again county A, county B and all that. But we can just say A, B, C, D and then just align the decimals so that it is more legible. Similarly, uh, in graphs, this is another mistake which happens. So this is a graph showing from 1940 to 2000. Um, anybody pointing out mistake in this? The range, right. So if you just zoom it for the area which is required, it's more clear now. Uh, representation of phases typically, this is a very common thing, people do that typically, but uh, how you want to show the transformation happening from left to right, phase one, phase two, phase three with arrows in between. So when we have such type of graphics and if we have the text and the color now in coming into place, I'm just moving on color scheme part. I'm showing you a couple of colors for a given word and you have to choose. Uh, this is a common question asked to me in most of the places where I go that uh, we have very, very boring subjects. We don't have such fancy words like you have showing uh, here like, uh, so what should the color be for us? So let us just try a small uh, example here. So this is the word military. Which one, which color will you choose typically for this? Yeah. Third one, green. Okay, you associate green. Second, how many for second? Second. Second is the blue military. Okay. Green military, very few. Okay. And pink military, anybody? <laughs> okay, nobody. <laughs> right. How many for gray military? Okay, one. <laughs> Good. Okay. Let us just complicate the matter. How many people for soft? Pink soft, how many people for pink soft? Most of the ladies wanted to raise their hands, but then they decided not to. Okay, how many for gray soft? None. How many for blue soft? Okay, and how many for green soft? Not many, right? So uh, you can see that there are prejudices coming in place right away because the way you want to use it. Okay, how many for space and what color for space? Gray space? Blue space? Lot of them, right? Green space, none. Uh, obviously, and pink space also, I don't see. Now we'll complete, uh, okay, so neutral is, uh, neutral was the answer to them. So it depends on uh, where are you using that because it depends a lot on the background also. For example, you have a very, very uh, pale yellow uh, background and then you can't see gray color on that. So even if gray is neutral, but you can't see it there. So that time you can use black to just say something neutral. It depends on that, but let's go ahead and see. So color, the choice of color is very subjective and uh, that is why I follow some kind of rules like this. So color is equal to mood and color is equal to expression. Uh, color is equal to convention. Most of them I have seen using red color uh, for something they want to emphasize. And uh, it, it is counterproductive at times because the topic you are talking mostly is not connected to that red at all. And it just gives some other meaning to the whole thing. So in fact, just today morning when I was preparing uh, the guideline slides and I wanted to give that um, a circle on the top and I selected blue for that. My daughter was sitting at the back and she said, make it green. I said, why? He said, you want them to follow this, right? Green is go. And so you should use green for that. And I agreed to that because yes, you, you would associate green with something you should do rather than red or pink or violet or maroon or whatever color comes to your mind. So color has meaning and it has meaning across cultures. So that is why you have to be very neutral at times when you choose colors for whatever you want to present. We will we'll complicate the matter in the next slides, but uh, just for the theory part, there are some color schemes and you can use them. The color guidelines are like that. So more contrast is more readability. Normally have highest contrast possible when you want to show readability. Like this is a classic example, such a big room and the projectors are low contrast projectors, right? But since I'm using only black and white, the contrast is the highest. I can't go beyond this, right? So uh, dim lit room should have 
white text on black and this is another very popular question. Should I use white text on black or should I use black text on white is, is something which is so because the lights are on here I decided to use the uh, black text on white option. The vivid and pale colors will definitely have red, very very less readability. I have seen slides where, which have blue, uh, bright blue uh, background uh, and another pale blue text which is very difficult to read. So from color we move to types and there are n number of types available now thanks to computer revolutions and uh, whatever uh, uh, it has happened in it, the way it has evolved you have like plenty of types suddenly and broadly they are categorized like this but which one suits and why now again we come back to that military thing okay so you have fonts now various fonts and uh, you have to choose a font for this so how many for the first one okay military uh, with the serif font military with the uh, the sans serif font the second one okay third one fourth one yeah lot of people are not uh, raising their hand for the fourth one primarily because they see the pink color there so i'm not asking for the pink color okay just forget that that is pink in color but still what will you use then so uh, as you see the difference your decision suddenly goes because of the color first of all and then you see the font so um, that is where I had put color guidelines before font guidelines because <laughs> the way you choose your colors becomes very important. Yeah, which one is military better now? Second one. Okay. Second one. Oh, still people go with second one. <laughs> Fourth one. Okay. What about soft? Again, same things happen because third one. Okay. What about space? Last one. Why last one? Okay, let us let us just analyze why last one. How many people for the last one? Not many. Okay, how many people for the second one? Lot of them. Okay, why second? Anybody who is pro second? It's more clear. Okay. So, uh, but when you are talking about space, do you want to? So clarity is important definitely. But then why are you choosing a font? Basically, you want to convey something else apart from just the clarity. Clarity is inherent. You need to have that. But you have a choice of font. So why not fourth one and why only second one? So does it associate with the spaceness of the word, the font? Is it that reason that you choose that? Because if it is a heading, then the fourth okay. one. If it okay. is a regular text, then it is a second one. Okay, valid point. So it depends on uh, where you are placing this particular word. If it is in heading, okay. So I'll I'll simplify that for you. If it this is a heading, which font will you use out of the four? Fourth. Fourth one. Okay, why? It's more clearer, bold. More bold. Okay. So now you now you are talking uh, from the point of view that heading should be bold, uh, heading should be mo most clearer. That is why you want the font which will justify these particular guide uh, our requirements, right? Okay. Let us let us go to the neutral one, uh, which is okay. So options are one, two, three, four, or none of the above. How many for none of the above? First of all, tell me. <laughs> Nobody, right? Okay. First one. Nobody. Second one. Okay, couple of them. Third one, lot of them. Fourth one, none of them. None of the above. <laughs> okay, couple of them. Okay, yeah, because because again you see that there is a complete uh, uh, disagreement. Oh, since it is a subjective thing, what is neutral for me need not be neutral for you. But we have to choose a font which is neutral to most of the people. That is the key. So when you see that lot of people second suggested. Uh, the third one right so they found neutral because times roman is considered as a standard font across so people will associate neutralization with that font easily so in the third one the diagram space written is more suitable with the content which we are talking about like first one space has more uh, graphical look the word space and Tech. the space is more graphical yes so in respect of above the other three yes. i think first one is better space exactly Okay, so yeah, you have raised a good point actually. So he had already started this debate from the point of view that if you know where this go is going to come, then you can possibly select it. Now I'll give you two scenarios. You are presenting in a CS conference, a topic of space vehicle, uh, something. And you are all, the second scenario is that you are, you are, place, you are uh, giving this presentation in a um, probably game developers forum where you are showing a game called Space Jam. Now, which one will you use and where? So, first one will be used where? 
Games. For the games, right? And the, the, the second one or the fourth one will be used in where? In the conference. Right? Suddenly you change the thing because you know the audience would like to look at it from that perspective. In isolation, if I ask you, obviously I can take your answer that the space has more visual appeal as space as compared to any of them. So I'll select that. The moment I tell you that, okay, use this in your presentation, you'll probably settle down for something else. If I tell you it has to be printed and distributed to everybody as a password, then you'll probably choose something else because that should be very small and readable at that font also. That's so fine. application will change you, but uh, which one suits and why is is the key which we are discussing and that from that point of view I think I'll take your answer for first and there will be some followers for you also probably. Okay, so this is another interesting uh, point I have observed is about emphasizing. So you want to emphasize a certain point in your presentation and there are multiple ways of doing it. You can do by maybe making it bold, you can do it by making it italics, you can make it by underlining and you can also do it by color. The problem happens when people do this. They make it bold, italic, color, underline, everything in, in the same word itself. And that is overemphasized. So Professor Fartak actually narrated a very interesting thing uh, last lecture of how overemphasized will, will be a problem. So most of the time you will see this uh, smoking strictly prohibited and that's what uh, was observed by one of his typists and he said why strictly prohibited prohibited itself has a dictionary, dictionary meaning not to be done right <laughs> so what is strictly not to be done and softly to be done not to be done so there are no variations within that right when you want to do emphasize if you have just made it bold it will be anyway standing out why do you want to make it italics and underline it and also change the color of that so over emphasizing becomes a problem so normally don't over emphasize anything so these are the typographic guidelines that you have to use as minimum fonts as possible uh, you have to pardon me for my presentation, it did not come under that purview. I am trying to show what are the different fonts, so I am using multiple fonts. <laughs> and uh, what are the font options which are used for emphasizing, so you can choose between the best emphasizing option at that given particular point. Again, it depends on the target audience and the kind of place where you are using it. Use the left aligned as much as possible wherever you can, but you can use justified, some, some of the research papers ask for justified uh, things, but for typically for presentations, people don't use justified. People use left aligned options. Mm, use grid. This is a new addition to my presentation. After I saw a couple of tools like uh, new Microsoft uh, tools which have uh, uh, Office 10 or something. So all these new softwares come with a built-in settings of grid. So what I mean by that is when I am trying to place this particular text, suppose probably you will not be able to see it. But if I, you, can you see the line now? Yes. Yeah, so this line is giving me the hint that it is in center of the whole presentation. Please use such guidelines and hints which are available in the software. I have seen people not using this and then manually uh, pressing their keyboard uh, whatever left and right buttons to center it manually. You have all the tools available. People have also have seen not using the centralized function given in the tool itself. They will put space bar or tab or something to centralize it. That is actually a very bad way of doing it. So when you have the text and visuals in place, then comes a very, very uh, popular feature in two new age presentation, which is called visual effects. So you have all these dropping of letters and <laughs> curling of letters and all that. You have uh, very, very fancy um, transitions of slides. You have door openings and you have uh, something like blast and you have page curls, very popular. You have Venetian blinds you have box turn and you have flying things, its range is really crazy and it is so much crazy that it will shock you and uh, so much so that uh, probably it will make you think that what was the topic of this presentation when it started. <laughs> by, the time, by the time you are here, you are just getting zapped away by all these things which are happening in between and if it is happening with you, it's most probably will also happen with your students who are watching this presentation one after another. Let us unwind, let us let's not do that. So uh, what should be done is you want the audience to take away the message, right? 
you don't want the audience to be taken away by the message. So when you do such gimmickry, it typically takes them away from the message rather than taking the message away. So that's how you, you want to place your uh, whatever presentation or the topics you want to do. And that the entire debate starts from this point. And this is the very, um, I'm coming to this slide almost uh, in the middle of the presentation because I wanted to show you all this rather than giving the theory of what is form and function. And there's a very classical debate all over the world from ages now that what should be thought first, whether I should think of form or I should think of function. So what is my take on this? So first of all, let us understand what is the form. Form is how do you show the message? And function is what is the message? So it actually, uh, it, these words have come up from product design background. So that is why it, it uses words like form and all things. But in our parlance, let us just simplify these definitions like this. Let us say, how do you show the message versus what is the message? Now if that is the thing, another example. So suppose the message is, you want to show a bunch of bristles to clean and apply something. So this is your target message. Now, what are the options to show? Uh, where, what is your target audience? It can be used for teeth, it can be used for face or paper. So for teeth, the application is different. How to be show that? For faces is different. And for paper, probably this is not the one you use, you use this one, right? So it depends that when you have a particular function uh, finalized as the, your objective of what you want to do, you can choose different varieties of forms to support that. And all these options will change based on your audience. That is why I said, whom are you showing to that, uh, showing this message to, will make a important state, um, decision making point for you. For example, uh, this is the title of my PhD thesis called Design Considerations for Creating E-Learning Animations. Uh, okay, key learning animations came animated way. This could have been one way of showing it, but it is not required when I'm talking about my thesis, right? So it should be just plain like this, because it is very legitimate and actually serves the purpose because I'm talking to the reviewers and not to uh, third grade students uh, who are just carried, like very much interested in looking at various animations I'm going to show them. So this is the take what I wanted to show you. So none of these is, is uh, to be neglected. Both are important. But the problem happens when inadequate attention is given to one of them. And uh, either excess attention is given to one of them. So too much of, uh, too much of form will lead to a chaos. And no form or um, thought about it will be ineffective. So you have everything plain black and white will typically lead to ineffective communication. So you have to strike the balance between the two. So what are the kind of suggestions? One is that content should govern your decision of choosing the form. So like you uh, said uh, in, in one of the answers, that if I have, if you tell me the audience, then I'll choose different font. But if you don't tell me the audience, then I'm clueless, like everything suits best for me that time. So if you know the audience, then choose the content accordingly. Uh, the choose the medium accordingly, have an appropriate design and also have an appropriate strategy. So from this point onwards, I'm going to uh, show you something uh, which is related to motion graphics. So since the audience is mostly from computer science background, I have chosen one topic of packet transfer, which is known to most of you, right? So if that is to be explained, I have just picked up a couple of visualizations created by other people uh, to show you a sample of how packet transfer is shown. And let us just all analyze them uh, by looking at it. Okay, so this is one of the options where you say there is a button called play. So I click here and can you all see? Right. So it is sending frame number one, it goes there. Uh, it will, it will reach there and one, uh, acknowledgement is sent back. Then the window moves ahead, it will go to two, three and zero. Then the frame two is sent, right? You have play pause button here and you can see it, right? The other option is where you can just, yeah. So here is it, this is the client and this is the server and you want to run the app. How does it do? Yeah, so it is sending from client to the server through the medium and you get some feedback, right? 
you will have another version of this probably where you do this okay so this is about packet switching a file a being sent from so this is that file can you see complete thing right so this f i l e is being split into four parts now and uh, when I click next, it is arranged from here, it is going on the network, it keeps on telling me, okay, so your views, out of the three what you saw, first, second and third, which one is the best representation of what you saw? The third one, how many for the third one? Okay, anybody, can you explain why third one? It has defined pauses. It has defined? Pauses. Pauses. Okay, so user has the full freedom to wait, watch, see things and then go ahead, right? Okay, how many for the second one? No? Why no? It's just a diagram. So, you don't, okay. So, but there is nothing wrong in diagram. Books have diagrams. It is going on its feet. It is going on its own. It is not giving any control to the users. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to elaborate? Ah. Only two nodes are considered here. In Only the next figure, that uh, intermediate nodes are also in included. Okay, so there is some change in the content also. Yeah. This is not completely showing what is happening. Okay, anything else apart from content? Okay, some some prior knowledge is you required to yes. in order to know this, and that is not considered. If that is not considered, you will not probably enjoy this. Okay, by the way, how many how many people agree that uh, uh, this looks very dull? None of you. Most of you, some of you, okay, some of us, okay. And uh, what about this then? Okay, what what with what is the problem with this? Or is there no problem with this? No problem. No problem. No problem. Okay. Why no problem? Everything is there. Everything is there. Whatever is to be there is there. Okay. But then why third one is better than this? Or you feel that first one is better than third one? How many for first one? Let's see this. This one. Okay. How many for third one? It has to be more, right? Because I saw more hands that time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when data to be transferred between two, that's a sender to receiver, and uh, with a, uh, what is that, the window size, right. this is elegant, sufficient. Correct. But the third one talks with respect to a complex network, okay. and he need to know that between two, there are multiple nodes through which right. it can transmit, right. congestion control and all, but that's not required to tell about the data transfer between uh, sender to receiver. Yes. So, okay, if I simplify this for you, uh, will you agree? Uh, point I wanted to say is that for different objectives, each of these are useful for a different objective. So, if I say that the objective is to only tell them what is packet transfer, probably one will suffice because you just know that something is sender, something is receiver, something is a medium. But if I want to show one more degree of complexity, I want to add that what is sliding window or something like that, then I will probably go for two. When I want to show them what are the congestions, what are the problems when F, I, L, E goes on the other side as I, E, L, F, then what happens, then probably three is better. So, the point I wanted to make that you can't take a standard undertaking that animation will be the most useful platform for everything and anything. So, oh yes. Actually, uh, you are saying we have to animate or we have to represent text more meaningful. Uh, okay. With animation or some uh, special effects. Okay. If we go with more meaningful in the sense, uh, it will create more complex. Uh, you are telling uh, if we go with space more meaningful in the sense we have to give a blank space or okay. white space if okay. we go with uh, neutral with more meaningful in the sense we have to do nothing <laughs> uh, okay according to your concept uh, if we go in the sense it will create a complexity for students uh, for uh, creative students or for bright students uh, it will be ap appreciable or uh, it will be good for normal thinkers, it will be complex. If we animated more in the sense, if we animated more meaningful in the sense. Okay. Um, whatever meaning I could get through this is, uh, I will I'll try to narrate it, you correct me if I'm wrong. So what I think this gentleman is trying to say is that, when I, when I uh, profess standing here, that use, uh, use the inherent meanings of words or images when you want to create a presentation 
and uh, your assumption is that if we create such things, students may not get the exact message, what you wanted to intend to explain them. Is it yeah. that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Anybody has the answer to that on my behalf? <laughs> okay. So, or should I give it? Okay. So, uh, the point is like this. Uh, you are absolutely right in uh, asking me this question that when on one side you say that use these fonts and colors and all that to, to maximize your communication to people. But uh, at the same time, if you see the slide carefully, I have told that it completely depends on the audience first of all. And yes. secondly, it is to be used at the point where it is necessary. So we had this example of if we are presenting in a CS conference or if we are presenting in a games lounge. So that depending on the audience, we'll change our point of view. So if you are presenting a space related, space roller um, a vehicle activity to students, probably you will not use those funky fonts and color schemes and all that. You will just use a very plain thing. The point here is uh, that although we, we understand that animation will help us explain complicated concepts, it depends again on the objective of what we are trying to say. When we say that we want only to tell them that what is the transmitter and what is the receiver and what is the medium, probably the option number two, which was bare black and white thing with just some dotted line going here and there will be sufficient. It will not create the chaos what you are, uh, what you are explaining. The moment I show the third one or the second one, just for a simple concept of what is packet transfer between the sender and the receiver, this might create chaos and that is exactly my point of showing the three options. So you have to choose very carefully since the content is available in abundance right now, it is your decision to choose the right one rather than choosing the first one which comes to your mind or first one which is available to you. That is why I deliberately did this exercise of finding out three options or three levels of animations available for the same concept, almost the same concept. Probably I'm, I'm not very correct in choosing the uh, concept right at times. It has some variation in the objectives itself. But overall, if you Google for packet transfer animation, you will get these three videos, right? So uh, the point I wanted to make was that it is, it is not important to just say that I am using animations to explain something. It is also important that I should be satisfied with the objective first of all and the audience which I am trying to connect with and then choose the appropriate one. So that is where uh, I wanted to show these three options. Okay, so the theory which, which actually writes this kind of decisions is this one and it is published by uh, somebody called Rini Weiss. Again, um, this graph and this slides are going to be available to you, so don't, no need to uh, take down whatever references. There is a reference at the end here. But it actually tells you the, the trajectory, uh, uh, it actually tells you the process of why to select an animation in first place. So it starts with that is, is trajectory or movement inherent in your chosen topic? So if you have trajectory or movement in your topic, only then you should just go on the left hand side which is the green side and then say that okay, is, is that function uh, being served for presentation or clarification? Then probably animation may be useful. But if your concept does not have any motion in your in the concept itself, it does not have any motion, no change over time or no trajectory, then probably animation is not useful. You can just make it happen with plain black and white simple slides without any transitions and those page curls and all that. It will just suffice. But uh, typically people don't uh, follow such things and then they either take a blanket decision of including animation everywhere or an including animation nowhere. So uh, the point is that if you just follow such principles, you will pro get a proper answer to each of the concept what you are trying to teach or explain to people. Yeah, so it is a two part thing that how, uh, which type of uh, concept or content will be requiring animation and how. So it will just show you differences between if you are telling a procedure to somebody or just a concept or you are only talking about some facts. So probably the facts is the, on the extreme right where it just says if it is some fact or a rule or a skill, you probably don't require animation for that. This is another 
popular debate I come across being an animator. Uh, most of the people ask me nowadays, the 3D is the in thing and should we use 3D animation or 2D animation and I again use the same thumb rule. So 3D or 2D is again immaterial the moment you have a particular concept with you. So the concept again should or the content should drive your decision for this thing. So again I will just show you a couple of examples. This is something which we have created for Brayton cycle and towards the end this is a um, part of the course of thermodynamics which is also being offered. The interesting point is that you here you will get an option to, to choose the options of uh, either you want to reheating on or you want to switch it off, you want to change the compressor uh, temperature, you want to change the pressure to something and the graph will show the corrective, uh, corrected uh, version of that immediately. This is a very popular video available on YouTube which has already got some like 3 lakh hits. Uh, it's a video and explained by uh, some faculty member or uh, organization head or somebody from. So he's talking about crude oil distillation process and after the visuals what it starts with a video of uh, that particular plant but then it comes to a point where you see that there is an inlet pipe and uh, he will explain in between actually what is happening. So the audio is also important but okay, here it will come to a place where you will see that this thing is boiling and vapors are getting generated. So this is one option, the other option is where you have a video of similar topic created for the people who uh, are already aware I, it's a repeat but for people who will not make out probably I will just uh, tell them that uh, this particular animation is created in a three dimensional software. On the other hand this particular animation is, uh, is created in a 2D animation software. Okay, so this, this is only to show you the point that the concept is the same but the tool is different. So this is a 2D animation tool, this is a 3D animation tool. You can see that there is hardly any difference in terms of the visualization. You can, you can see the same animation, the motion is the same. You see the overflow of a liquid happening and it is getting down and you can, you cannot see actually. But uh, so there are vapors coming out of this when it starts boiling. A similar thing is being shown in this but using a two dimensional tool, something like flash or uh, other maybe, I am not sure which one. But this is only to tell you the point that the selection of tool has actually no bearing in terms of uh, what you what you are being shown there. It was the concept of being able to show a cross section of this distillation column where students can see this uh, overflow of liquid and because the temperatures are so high no camera can go inside. So only at that point they decided to select animation as the tool to animate this rather than selecting a video of camera video. So that is why I wanted to say this aspect that you have various options uh, in terms of creating media but the choice should be driven by the content and uh, that is where I wanted to make that point. So this, these two animations will tell you that it, will, it is not very important. Okay, so the takeaways from this particular topic, uh, today's session. So one is that let content and its application or the audience actually decide the use of mediums and the mediums are your fonts, colors, graphics, either static or visual graphics. Uh, there are well researched guidelines available for using these uh, mediums, so please follow them. Um, the green dot is there to remind you that all the slides having green dot in the presentation earlier can be easily copied and made into a, just a guideline document for yourself. And the last but not the least is to test them before presenting like the one I am doing here now is a, is a complete flop of that for third thing that I didn't test whether all my animations are visible in this particular audience. Although they are very clear on my laptop they are not happening here. And that is why I never forget Mr. Murphy who will tell you that whatever can go wrong will go wrong. So uh, 
don't underestimate that uh, power of that Mr. Murphy because he is capable of ruining best of the presentations. So test them any time when you go. Even though I came here half an hour while you all were having tea, the one thing which I didn't test was whether all my animations are seen correctly on this slide. So this is the output which, which will happen most of the time. So I think with that, I will stop here. And uh, if you have any queries or comments on this, you can, okay, there is a question there. Yeah. I want to know the sum of softwares by which help we can create these animations or ah. graphics easily. Okay. Some open source softwares. Okay, can, uh, again, same thing. Can anybody answer on my behalf? I will anyway answer. And it's interesting if peer interaction happens. Okay. Scratch is one software developed by MIT. Scratch. Uh, Scratch. Yeah. So this is one very good resource uh, uh, said by this gentleman here. The name of the software is Scratch. Probably I'll start writing them down here. So this is called S C R A T C H, right? Scratch by MIT. So you have to just Google for this. This is a very good programming tool, and it's a very easy to use programming tool. Just drop down and it will connect to each other and then you can just say play and you'll see the animation happening. So it's a very, very easy. In fact, we have tried teaching this tool to school children and they were able to program very well using this, right? Okay, so anybody else want to add to the list? Okay, Prezi for presentations, okay. How many people know about Prezi? Uh, it's a tool available to make presentations in which you can uh, zoom into a particular text and emphasize it and uh, you can add a flow to the presentation very nicely. But it's not an open uh, it's, uh, I think it's a paid software, but uh, limited edition is available for free. Okay, so you are correct. It is a, it is a free online tool. Uh, if you want to use it online, you can create a login and in, you can create your own presentations online. You can show them. You can download a PDF also, free of cost. But if you want to download the entire tool where without internet you should be able to edit it, I think that is the paid version. But rest of the thing is free. Uh, one thing I would like to add to what she said, Prezi is one software which will give you the overall view of your presentation in the same um, image or same location. So same space actually. So it will actually not create slides as one behind another, but the slides will be placed on a big platform on in a space at the same time. So you know, essentially what it happens is you can create the order of slide one, two, three, four, and it will just zoom from one slide another and so any point in time you want to show the entire picture, it is available to you. So that's the advantage of Prezi. Okay, sir, anybody? Sir. sir, my question is related to animation. Suppose I want to make any mo animated movie that is uh, related to temple. Uh, it consists of some animated character that showing the from where we enter, from where is exit and some crowd. But uh, it, it can be show, it only shown by the just small character, animated character. So what, which uh, software should I use for that? making animated movie in a simple way. Okay, so... I have tried many software, but uh, uh, all these are software so much complex, so I am able to make that animated movie related to any temple. Which one, which one did you try? Uh, <laughs> Maya software. <laughs> Maya, okay. Obviously, you will end up with that problem at the end. Okay, so to answer your thing, I have a uh, couple of uh, suggestions. First and foremost, you have to justify whether an animated movie with characters is required to explain your concept, right? So we, we can show by MAPE, but that is a strategy. I just want, it is really, MAPE, but uh, some animated character just moving, that is the entry point, that is the exit point, here is a, there is a very crowd in that temple. So we are just watching that movie, we are able to know more about our temple. Okay, so you want, so I'm saying you should be yourself justified that animation is the solution for your problem, what you are trying to say. After that, animation has to be done. That is one. Why I'm saying it for animation especially is because it's a very, very costly affair, not only in terms of money, but in terms of resource. You don't get animators so very easily and you yes, don't sir. get... But will you science. please suggest me any software that we can easily done our task? We use something called Blender. So student who want to... Uh, and do something in animation. Uh, what are the areas? Because the uh, coaching institute uh, who teach them animation are very costly. Ah, uh, okay. Again, uh, the same question. But um, 
like I said, let us uh, limit this discussion to how to use animation in your educational teaching activities only. It is also a point that how, how will students do animation if they ask you this question. The answer we have for you is something called Blender, which is an open source 3D animation tool. I am just going to show you a couple of uh, things which we have done in Blender. For example, so these are two pictures. Uh, one of them is a photograph and other one is created using a 3D tool called Blender. So can you spot which one is animated and which one is a photograph? Right. How many people feel right one is created using software? <laughs> left? Others have to be left, yeah. Okay, fine. So uh, the answer is the right one is created using software. Uh, this is created using a tool called Blender, which we use. Even this is Blender, this is Blender. Okay, so the inset area, this, this is a photograph and this is Blender, right? This is a photograph and this is Blender. So what we do is we have a repository of models, such models on our website called oscar.iitb.ac.in where we'll have around 200 such models only for educational purpose. There are no characters, no Tom, no Jerry. Uh, there are only uh, educational uh, <laughs> models like <laughs> test tube, beakers, vernier calipers and other things. There are um, animations available which are also educational animations like the distillation column what you saw, the 3D one is created in-house and that is also becoming very popular on YouTube. Recently we just saw that it has already uh, crossed some 2 lakh hits on YouTube which was not even, uh, we were not even aware of this fact. But such is the power. Uh, we also create interactive games using Blender and that is the power of uh, Blender because Blender has a built in game engine and uh, like I have in the at the end of my presentation I had given uh, my website. So you have to google for Samir Sahasrabuddha or S1000 Brains any one of the names is fine. You will come to my website. There I have, ex I have given uh, enough links for all the projects which we have conducted using Blender. At the end probably I would like to show you one such example here. So this is a character created for teaching uh, computer programming and this character is called Dumbo. But this is used specifically by Professor Fatak to explain certain concepts in programming, very very basic concepts in programming. Um, and that is where this character is introduced to teach some very basic ones uh, which we will be animating actually eventually. We are already animating, couple of uh, the shots are ready but these are, these are the things which we will be using. Okay, anybody else? Swiss software sir. It's for mainly for 2D and SW, it creates SWF files. Yeah, yeah. text and image animations. Yeah, yeah. text and image. It's a pay tool, sir. Okay. Classroom presenter. It's a presentation tool. Free. For all versions like Apple, uh, okay. Linux and Windows. Huh? You can write notes on the slides. Okay. Why add? Why add? Yes, that is, that is a very important tool actually. How many people know about why add? How many people are aware of this tool? If not, you should be. Uh, probably you can just say a couple of lines about it. Wired is a very good tool for, especially for uh, drawing, uh, for technical uh, uh, objects like uh, uh, object presentation and uh, water bubbles, uh, DFD, Charts, control flow plans. diagram, and whatever we need in uh, writing a research paper. Yeah. Wired is a very popular tool, a very uh, powerful tool by the way. Uh, it has a very good grid support. So uh, most of the time I have come across being a designer, I get some uh, weird mails at times saying that this is my diagram, can you polish it? So <laughs> that polishing is supposed to be to change the fonts, to change the alignment and all that. If you use Wired, I will bet that you will be creating one of the best looking uh, diagrams because that actually does not permit you to create a bad diagram. It has a very much built in settings where you can just say uh, simplify diagram and it will just clear off all your jagged lines to straight lines and all that. It's a very powerful tool. I suggest all of you to use it. It's a free tool. Uh, just. I, w I would like to just supplement uh, one thing. 
there is one website sf.net more than 3 lakh uh, open source softwares are available for audio video animation everything is given there okay i think let us stop here so he mentioned that dumbo character <coughs> incidentally the uh, my course on introduction to computer programming starts with the general discussion of procedures and instructions where i take normal day to day activity like a recipe for preparing some food or doing some action some work or something and describe how a set of instructions could be written then i say that in case of computer i need a computing model in my mind and then i would like to construct some instructions for that model so that model actually revolves around uh, uh, a, a dumb character called dumbo we, i call him buddhuram dumbo that is that is the name given and he uses a cupboard with set of drawers each drawer is like a memory location he uses a workbench where there are some registers where he can do some computing and then he uses a cart to carry values from outside to the cupboard and from cupboard to the outside so this is a short movie now uh, this is being modified because there were some errors there and that is why i think samir was not keen to show you this movie although he didn't have it anyway so this is that cupboard where the uh, memory locations are named it is shown how there would be some value inside a location these values are supposed to have come in through some earlier input operation the value for some is shown as a question mark meaning we do not know what that value is this is our mr dumbo who is executing the instruction sum is equal to a plus b so he takes out a copy of that value from the location puts it in a register then he takes out the value b these are the two values to be added notice that by mistake the previous value has gone to another register automatically which is incorrect it should stay in whichever register it was copied now this is shown how he will add on his workbench and these two this addition will result into a value 47 now this is still on the workbench so we'll copy that value 47 and put it in the location for sum so this is how he completes the operation which is sum is equal to a plus b i have consistently found that this simple model creates for people who have never seen a computer or have not read anything about computers etc they can form a mental model of a memory location which later on i can relate to a variable and so on the fact that all locations are sort of fixed size okay helps me to relate them to the notion of byte or word or something like that the fact that when i uh, so there is there is another uh, we're combining multiple of these but it's worthwhile for example you look at the input operation so here is a question mark he will now take that value and 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 and, and put it inside so you will notice that uh, the question mark will now be replaced by this so this is i use it to emphasize that at any time only one value can be inside and if there is any earlier value it will get uh, replaced similarly when we show the output operation here he has to take the value of sum out but this time he will bring the cart here and he will make a copy of the value in sum so it is important to emphasize that in an output operation the value inside the location is not destroyed it remains there and only a copy goes out uh, now the whole uh, animation film introducing these simple components of a computer a uh, uh, set of drawers in a cupboard as memory a uh, workbench a uh, uh, carriage which the dumbo carries and the buddhuram dumbo himself does not take more than 4 to 5 minutes to play it does not take more than 2 to 3 more minutes to describe the execution of a program which says input a comma b sum is equal to a plus b output sum but this immediately tells people about how the actual computer programs would look like so the artificial programming language which i have sort of constructed for dumbo much like your turtle graphics okay 
is something which is very similar to the conventional programming language, but the syntax is not as rigid. I use, for example, the term use locations A, B, sum. Because I tell people that the, the drawers are only just drawers and there's some name tags have to be put before the Dumbo can use them. Now this I relate later on to the declaration of variables. I have found that these simple things are then very easily mapped by students into the corresponding computer concept. Now you can, I used to do that earlier by drawing a caricature of Dumbo on a slide and things like that. But an animation is, as you can see, far more powerful. And this is a blender animation. So there are two advantages. Not only, of course, the final product is uh, free of license, so anybody can use it. But once I put the underlying animation components, which are created in Blender on a shareable resource, any one of you can take those components and modify that Blender, modify that animation and use it in your own way. You can give a voiceover, in my case it will be a voiceover in English, yesterday we have seen, you can give a voiceover in Telugu, Tamil, Marathi, Hindi, Urdu, whatever. Now these are the advantages of open source components. But any practically useful uh, costed component can also be used if you think it is important and it is relevant. The only thing is that Samir said, it is a time consuming thing. You require a specialized trained personnel who can use Blender. We have trained such people and in fact Samir and his team now run such training programs in different universities, workshops. They call people who want to run Blender animation and so on. And we have, somebody mentioned the Maya Academy, this thing is one of the most popular commercial software, right? Mm -hmm. So we actually have a senior manager, his colleague, Ajit Chipunkar, who used to work with such animators uh, who used to be uh, sort of Maya specialist or whatever it is. And he discovered that using Blender is A, far cheaper and trained people can are required. So he actually trained himself first and all others and he leads our team of the group of animation. So the point is that Blender doesn't stop at the point where you create animations, but you can create interactive animations. And I was referring to the point that when you have the audience in your mind and now the audience is shifting to more interactive versions like the Akash tablets what you have. So we are now in process of converting that content suitable for Akash tablets or tablets in, in general, Android tablets. So what can happen is that, if for, for example, this is the PVT diagram typically used in thermodynamics, which is a 3D structure because it has three axes and students find it increasingly difficult to understand the three axis point of view. So we have created a 3D um, animation of uh, this particular uh, concept and uh, it is easy to run that on Blender after we have worked on it. So this gives you the option of uh, rotating it. You can see the PV perspective, you can see the PT perspective, you can see the VT perspective, you can also see the 3D perspective and uh, within 3D you can rotate it. So these kind of things are possible within Blender only because this is the only 3D tool which has a game engine built into it. Otherwise you have to create models in Maya or other 3D animation tools and then go to another game engine to create the interactive models. The point of view what we are following is that for the content which is to be gone on this type of um, material in future, it should be using all the advances what are uh, given to us by the medium itself. So if this medium gives you the touch, then it should explore the touch in the best possible manner. And uh, for example, in, in the next uh, future things that we want to use that, use the accelerometer built into this and you can just do this to rotate it like you do in while playing uh, whatever temple run or whatever the games are. So uh, that should be the ideal case where you are using the potential of the medium and not just simply watching the same website which is available on desktop, you are watching it on the tablet is not use of a tablet. So that is where we are trying to go ahead in and uh, me and my colleagues actually are uh, doing it right now. One of them is here, Nitin, who has uh, done this animation. Thanks. Uh the point of this entire session was that all of us as teachers, uh, we must do the following and we must also emphasize this uh, to 10,000 colleague teachers will come here. That 
we must learn a to adapt all such technical innovations which are easily possible to be integrated in our teaching some of you will recall that in old days there were no uh, software to prepare transparencies many of us would take those plastic sheets and write by some thick camlin pens horrible handwriting or whatever it is but that was considered better than using a board for two reasons the font on the board could not be visible to a large class and second you will lose too much time in writing whereas you could have pre prepared transparency then it took quite some time for all of us to recognize that if you have pre prepared transparencies in an actual classroom setting the impact is much less for example a ready made program being shown completely to people has much less learning value then when you write statements one by one so what we do is we animate these slides where a line by line it appears but it is still more effective if i write using a, a, a either a device like this where it can produce this so we we actually in the classroom in actual setting we write the program we develop that program and then we go back to the slide to show the complete program the showing the complete program first and reading lines of it is not as effective in in learning for students then actually developing that program and then showing the complete now these are some tricks of the trades which we all learn individually or from some experience from others but i think it is important in modern times to train every teacher right from day one that these are the things that you can use and i will tell you there is no doubt that as the uh, online contents are used more and more and as they get integrated more and more into our educational processes things like animation will become important things like effective preparation of your lecture material be slides or whatever will become important and such things as the choice of the color scheme the choice of font the choice of these which today arbitrarily happens each individual teacher discovers what is right or wrong and decides on that point whereas a little bit of orientation could be useful so i hope you agree that in our 10000 teachers training program also we could have a session like this for the benefit of all teachers thanks a lot